the brains behind it. Um, so what will we be doing today? Let's go on a discovery path of, we'll be talking about like, what is an agile coach and enterprise coach, the high level views, similarity and differences, some benefits of both. Um, three considerations when you're trying to consider which path to go, how you show up, um, decision making, your skills and your passions uh, or your focus. Um, and we're going to help you. You will help figure out your build your map and courses and books. Well, books, Kevin has a slew of books and <laughs> we can tell you about some books as well. <laughs> so. Kevin, do you want to, I'll speak to the Agile team. Yeah, coach, yeah, and Kevin perfect. Will speak to the enterprise. So of course, we know these are some of the things that we look at a very high level that Agile team coaches do. They work at the team level, they improve team performance, development, operational excellence, and they really help with flow <laughs> and dependencies between teams. And they help have better business agility. I'm curious, as you guys are thinking, I would love for you to put in the chat, what do you believe agile team coaches do? And what do you believe enterprise coaches do? And then I'm going to let Kevin say a little bit about enterprise coaches. Sure. That. So we operate at the organizational level. Um, in some cases, that is truly entire organizational system and in some cases, that's maybe program level or business unit level. Um, it's uh, so the, the, the sort of scope of enterprise can vary widely across different um, contexts. Though the the kind of the commonality is that they tend to be um, very boundary spanning. It's not just in one part of the organization functionally. Um, though we have it's interdepartmental. Um, we spend a lot of time interfacing really closely with uh, senior leaders. So instead of having close relationships with say a team or a couple of teams, um, I tend to have really close relationships with um, senior managers. Yeah. Um, the question of uh, scaling is always ever present. Uh, my short uh, kind of uh, snarky answer to that is scaling just gets you more of what you've already got. So if you're happy with what you've got, scale away. If you're not happy with what you've already got, um, scaling is not going to solve your problems. You might want to get your fundamentals dialed in first before you make it big. Um, and so uh, I actually don't do a whole lot of scaling. I, I try to try to do very little of it because I'm trying to fix the fundamental problems first um, and enable that organization's vision and strategic goals to be accomplished. Um, sometimes they don't even know what those are. And so I help them to, uh, to articulate them. Yeah. And so in this also scaling is also when we do organizational change, like how do we scale uh, agility across different departments and organizations? But yeah, mm -hmm. I'm all with you. Um, and Joshua, we will get to that um, about the product line. Um, <laughs> what's in the middle of all of this? Those are the people who get it from both sides. <laughs> <laughs> They get from they get pulled from the team. They get pulled from um, the um, the executive level as well. So, if any questions, please throw them in the chat. So we did want to go over what is similar between the two. What's what are some core fundamental skills that they both need? Uh, we'd love for you guys to throw them up in there if you can think of any before we start. But I will start. Um, this is one of my passions. So I'm gonna speak to him, let like Kevin speak to the next one. It's facilitation. All coaches need to be good. And I, I mean good facilitation. I mean like being able to hold space, being able to create a design of facilitation, um, being able to be neutral and not, you know, guiding the guiding the path all the way through, like just leading it. Um, and professional coaching. I do not in any way mean like they say like I'm an agile coach but then you don't know how to professionally coach one-on-one -on -one or with the team asking questions powerful questions silence listening oh do you hear me um <laughs> but really professional coaching skills um so I have a big thing about this one mm -hmm. because some people don't they come in our courses and they don't know what professional co coaching is they actually think of it as mentoring they think it's that I need to tell someone what to do instead of listening that the person has the answer within them and helping them find that path. Nice. So developing self as leader, 
and the uh, certainly the ICE EC competencies. Uh, those of us who wrote it were very, very in strong, strong agreement that self as uh, instrument of change. And that language comes from Michael Spade and Lisa Atkins. Uh, it's the first place I've really heard it. And Michael was, was one of the co-creators of that set of competencies that we can't help organizations or leaders achieve and unlock levels of um, kind of capability that we have not done for ourselves. And so if we don't know how to um, be at peace in really strong conflict, uh, we can't guide an organization to be um, at peace in its very strong conflict is an example of that. So uh, knowing very clearly who we are as practitioners, uh, knowing our limitations, uh, the enterprise space is far, far, far too wide for any one practitioner to be able to do it all. And so knowing kind of where do you want to fit in that um, landscape and then how do you find other people that you can collaborate with uh, to complement what, what you are not able to do. So those are um, some really, uh, really important pieces of developing yourself as a leader. I have to add this, know your impact people, know how you show up, know, you know, your strengths, your superpowers, please throw in a chat. What are your superpowers, people? Oh my goodness. Know your strengths, know where you need help and asking for help. Developing yourself as leaders, like knowing who you are. There's so many people that don't know their impact. They think they're showing up this way and they're showing up a different way. They're like, I don't know why they don't just be empowered, whatever that means. <laughs> um, but instead of creating an empowered space. Um, so teaching and mentoring, this is important that people know. Does anybody like anybody want to share what they think teaching and mentoring is from an agile space? Not well, you come off mute. Not we'll just do it. I'll just do it. Teaching. We all know what teaching is, it, but it's not, it's like training from the back of the room. It's not just talking at people, it is training. It's being able to be versatile with how that you teach. It's being able to um, use a Google Jamboard or use a PowerPoint, use it different ways so that it sticks. It's the stickiness of it, um, creating an experience. And mentoring is giving options and being okay with it and letting the the person, the mentee have resonant choice, not advising and telling them what to do and then getting mad because they don't do it. <laughs> not, that is not mentoring. So, um, Kevin. Cool. Yep. Agile and lean. So um, you might be recognizing some of the X-Wing model, the, the coaching competency framework um, that was released by the Agile Coaching Institute some time back. Man, that thing's almost, that's over 10 years old now, I think. Uh, and so, yeah, definitely if we're going to be agile coaches at any level, uh, you, we better have some pretty solid background of expertise and competence in this thing we call agile and the, the sort of the origins of lean, um, how that makes sense from a manufacturing context, which is where lean, or you could even go further back to the Toyota production system. And what of that we can map to knowledge work and what of it we cannot map to knowledge work and what are the differences? I mean, it is not a one-to-one. -one. We cannot, uh, we're, you know, we're not building uh, mechanical things here, um, at least not knowledge work. We're, we're working with ideas and uh, working with ideas and creating value through them is, is very different in some very critical ways from uh, physical manufacturing. So knowing those things is important and not only having, for example, like I started as a scrum master a, a while back and that's, I knew that really well. And that was sort of my hammer for the world. Everything could be solved by scrum. Um, and then I learned about Kanban and that became sort of my big tool and everything could be sort of solved by Kanban. And as I moved through um, my path, my learning path, uh, finding as many of those kinds of tools as possible and picking up complexity science and value streams and managing flow and uh, all these other things uh, along the way. So it's, it's critical on both to have a very, very deep and wide expertise in the spaces of agile and lean thinking. 
Yes. And also knowing which hat to put on. So choosing your agile stance is what hat do we put on? Are we are we a leader? Are we what are we teaching? Are we mentoring? Are because we wear so many amazing different hats. And it's knowing which hat to use and which one is going to um, have the most impact. And if we put on the wrong hat, it's like, oops, fill your ball, we put on a different hat. Um, and but that is what the choosing agile. And yes, emotional intelligence, yes, Joshua, is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, it's so important to be emotionally intelligent, being able to sense where people are and knowing yourself first. So many, we're so good at saying, well, you or you, but do we know ourselves? Having that self reflection and being able to adapt to self manage. So critical. The growth mindset. So we're going to start throwing some books at you. <laughs> so growth mindset came from Carol Dweck's book, Mindset. Um, and she presents two mindsets. One is the growth mindset. One is the fixed mindset, um, perhaps oversimplified because none of us are all of one or all of the other. We're not monoliths. We're these beautiful, messy combinations of these things. Um, the growth mindset, though, being the belief that you can improve and the fixed mindset being the belief that you're you're born with what you got and if you didn't get it at birth you don't got it and you can't have it so i think that's pretty limiting i try to avoid that wherever i possibly can and find ways to adopt a growth mindset and foster that uh, perhaps the the most important word is yet okay. i don't know how to do that yet i'm not good at that yet I, I haven't learned how to do that yet so if you can just add that yet to the limitation that you're imposing or someone else is imposing um, you can help foster that growth mindset yeah i love that and the doctor was saying keeping a learning mindset and i'm going to add i'm not good at that yet however i'm going to go talk to kevin because it is something that you know i want to spend a lot of 80 percent of my time on my strengths and so i'm not a virtual assistant so i hired one i don't want to know how to do it yet <laughs> so but yes there is a yet i agree <laughs> um possibility so what this means is having a being real, not just like anything's possible, but having a realistic mindset as well. Like what is actually possible? And Angela, we need to be able to see in front of us, behind us, around us, but see what's possible and be able to ask for help, ask for questions, um, ask questions um, and be curious. So being realistic doesn't mean being like, um, you know, like negative, it's just, this is what's real. This is what's possible in this moment It's possible, but also looking forward. This is what may be possible. Mm -hmm. So possibility is something that is really needed. Um, that's that yet that Kevin was talking about. <laughs> uh, and are we having fun yet? It's all about fun too. So one of the things that we all need, and this is one of my big, you know, values is fun is that sometimes we get really we forget about ourselves and self-care and we forget to enjoy it have fun in the moment um it's not always fun and games but it's good to throw a little bit of fun in there because it's so important um to bring the human um to both of these so it's big for garfield so i'm just saying um so, so let's talk about team mastery and enterprise mastery Come on, we're pretty obvious. Team process, organizational change. These are two of the differences. So we'll show you the differences. Yeah, and as, as these fly in, one of the things, excuse me, that, that I, I've come to believe is true, and I think this is really an important point, is that enterprise coaching is not something you do after team coaching. Team, team mastery is not a stepping stone to enterprise coaching. They're both full featured disciplines. And while there's a lot of overlap in that middle area, there's also a lot of very specific um, practices and capabilities uh, that, that live in each of them. And so as Lura and I were, were putting this together today, I was thinking about um, if anyone's watched the, uh, the final dance, is that what it's called? About the bulls? 
Oh, it's yeah. a real the the series about the Bulls, and so they they follow um, you know Michael Jordan's obviously featured hugely in there, and he was he's a professional athlete, and so professional athletes share a lot of things, especially those who I think play ball sports. Uh, he was a, a very very amazing professional basketball player, and then he retired and went to become a professional baseball player. And to become a professional baseball player, he had to unbecome a professional basketball player. And then when he went back to basketball, he had to unbecome a professional baseball player to rebecome a professional basketball player. I think this is the same thing for us. And I've been in organizations where I've tried to step from an enterprise role back into a team role as a scrum master temporarily, and then have been replaced by somebody who's actually a full-time scrum master. That's what he did. And he was able to run circles around me. I was just really rusty. I just hadn't been in that space for so long and I hadn't had time to come back up to speed. So these things are, they're same, but very different also. Yeah. And they, they tend to, if you see like team ways of working and then you see or organizational system entry um, and organizational change process, they're different, but they're scaled up. So they scale in a, a different way, like where, you know, one's on the team, one's on the organization. Team impediments versus identify organizational gaps. Um, champion leaders within teams. For agile competencies, that's the X game. That's the, that is the learning, teaching, coaching, facilitation. And so as we look at these, I want, Kevin, can you speak to this one works with complex adaptive system? Oh, yes. Um, so complexity is a thing. Complexity uh, is not, to use Kenevan vernacular, more complicated. Uh, it's completely fundamentally different. And a lot of our organizations and leadership mindsets and paradigms these days get into a lot of trouble because they are very, very good at solving complicated problems and try to bring those same tool sets into the comp complex uh, contexts that they're actually now confronted with. And it doesn't work so well. So what are some things about complex adaptive systems? The big one is cause and effect come apart. We no longer have predictability with cause and effect. So while we can sort of hypothesize what is likely to happen as we do things, we won't know until we can see what happened as a result. And if that's true, it might be a good idea to not uh, set off a lot of really big things um, that could, could have very large ramifications and unintended consequences, it might be better to have a series of smaller things that you can learn from as you go. So that might sound a lot like, I don't know, iterative development with lots of feedback loops. Um, the reason we do that is because of that complex, uh, that complex that dynamic. The reason it's adaptive is complex things change as you interact with them. So as you build a product, for example, and people play with that product, their expectation and needs about what they can do it change also. So, you know, my iPhone 11 is not just a fancier version of the iPhone one. It's kind of a whole different thing, really, because our expectations have evolved. The technology has evolved. Our, how we use it has evolved. The services that are then come, to, come into being because they now can uh, evolve and it all changes together uh, in, in sort of responsiveness with each other in a very, very unpredictable way. And so if that's the world we're working in, we gotta be choosing tools and thinking and approaches that are made for it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I love that because the, the big difference is when you're in the enterprise, you work with complex adaptive systems and as a team, you look at the team as a complex adaptive system. So it's different of how you are approaching them, even though they're both complex adaptive systems. Mm -hmm. They need more emergent and experiments and things like that to happen. As we look at this slide, I'm wondering if there's any questions, because this is a lot. And then one, of them, a came, lot. one of them came in as white, but you don't see it. And I don't know what it is, because I don't know why it came in as white. Ooh, very curious and general any coaching at team level. This is a what? You want me to read this? Um, that's a lot, BJ. What are you saying? <laughs> Who takes on their enterprise? Okay, I get it. Of course, let's hear an awesome slide. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Because I'm going to move forward. We are I've, I've, I've got a... Yeah. Sorry, I've got a quick question. So um, 
you know, one of the competence for organizational change uh, and enterprise coaching is around, um, uh, oh gosh, you just dropped the slide. Oh, you uh, want me to bring it back I think up? it was, I think it was around, I think it was around um, champ, championing leaders and developing leaders at all levels. Yeah. Um, can you, can you describe what that looks like? And the reason I ask is because I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm actually working with a, a big company helping with uh, mostly the enterprise coaching, some, some on the team side, but mostly enterprise coaching. And I'm just curious if you have tips or ideas around um, how, how you, how you level set with high level leaders in an organization when mm -hmm. you're, you're just there as a coach, you know what I mean? Is, is it, yeah, so um, I think it's a great question. Can we t take a couple of minutes on that, Larry, or do you want to come back to it no, later can, on? No, let's take a minute, please. Okay. Um, so just as, you know, this idea of self as leader, that we can only uh, lead others to the degree that we've led ourselves, most, as a rule of thumb, <laughs> and you might, you might agree, you might disagree, I would say that most of the leaders, by far, like 90 plus percent of them, do not have yet the thinking and emotional capabilities to deal with the degree of complexity they face on a daily basis. Yeah. They don't know what to do, which is why they call us and why they pay us. And so they want us to help them. What they don't understand is I can't or you can't just come in and give them the answer that we have to come in and work with them to develop that capability internally so that they can do it themselves, which is why it's a coaching approach, not a consultative approach. So if we can agree on that part, then it's like, well, how do we do that? And so what I like to do is bring in uh, Bill Joyner's work around leadership agility. Um, I'm a certified leadership agility 360 coach. So I can, if they'll, if they'll take it, I'll, I'll have them uh, buy those assessments and we'll run through those assessments so that they can see for themselves a, a developmental pathway to increase their leadership agility. Um, across those different action arenas in that model and the, the various capabilities and competencies um, that are in, contained within it. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not, I have a poor track record at getting people to agree to do it. It's easy to get them to agree that they need it. And then when it comes time to, all right, well, so let's action this thing. Here's my suggestion. Can we proceed with this? Uh, no, HR won't let us, or, you know, we've already got a 360, or um, we don't have time, or, um, we already spend, you know, not only does HR already have one, but we already spend two months at the end of every year doing a big 360, so we can't load another one into the system. Um, so it's hard. It's a challenge uh, because most 360s, I don't think, are vertically oriented, vertically developmentally oriented, um, the way that the leadership agility is or the leadership circle is. Uh, and, and we need that. It's not just about horizontal development of getting better at your level of existing leadership. It's how do we fundamentally get access to other paradigms of thought and uh, emotional intelligence? Hmm. And that's a big question. Is that answer? What, tell me, because that was a long question. Does. Does it <laughs> it well, does. What was your question? What was your question? Cause I didn't my, really. My, yeah, my question was really around, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're brought on as a coach, um, obviously there's multiple levels in an organization yeah. how do you how do you coach people at higher levels than you know than maybe even your 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 the client that brought you in right yeah. like, like um and i and i think mm -hmm. i think you kind of answered that kevin in that you said 90 percent of of executives tend to be kind of uh, out of their league on the complexity that they face yeah. and and so that, that helps a lot um yep yeah. And, and, really and just go, go ahead, ahead, Larry. Sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, constraints are a real thing. You know, theory of constraints is a, is a very powerful body of work and constraints um, from an organizational perspective are a very real thing. And so it can be um, a, a, just a paradox laden pathway to try to introduce agility to organizations that are fundamentally constrained from achieving it. And so how do we do that? How do we how do we kind of make our way through that? How do we navigate that as change agents? That's a question that every time you do it is going to change. It's, 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 yeah. It is its own complex adaptive response um, that the thing you did last time is not going to work next time. So you just have to get good at being uh, extremely adaptive and nimble yourself and um, right. constantly pivoting and 
and changing it up and and being ready to be surprised um, about what are the pathways. Um, real quick example, uh, my one of my big clients is State of Maine. Um, I got involved in the vendor procurement uh, project a couple of years ago with them. I guided them through their first agile contracting uh, process and the entire state procurement apparatus caught wind of it and has said, this is what we've been looking for. And they're beginning to, to pivot their entire procurement process to become agile based. And I, that's not what I intended to do. That's not what they hired me to do. I was just trying to make one little part of their system better and it happened to be the right thing at the right time. And so it got this huge uptake and it was just luck. Yeah. I'll ask you a question really quick, Jaffa. Thank you, Kevin. Um, told you he's a, a smartphone. Um, so wh what is it that is difficult for you in this? Like, what is the, you said, how do I do it? What is the impediment that you're seeing? I'm curious. So I'm, I'm early on in this particular engagement that I'm in yeah. and um, trying to figure out how much I say and how much I listen, I think is the challenge when I'm working with executives, right? Because mm -hmm. I'll, I'll hear things where I'm like, I'm like, eh, that's, 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 I was in a conversation the other day and they, it, it was a, a senior director, I think, asking mm -hmm. about, um, they wanted to see metrics at an individual level out of JIRA yeah. because they wanted to see who was working hard and who wasn't. And it, <laughs> that wasn't the battle, that wasn't the battle that I wanted to face at that moment. And so I didn't, I didn't coach them on it. Um, I, I, I'm waiting for my moment on that, but um, I did coach them around, you know, how, how they should be looking at the team in general. And, and we talked a little bit more on it, but, um, but just situations like that, where I'm like, eh, this guy's a VP or, or a senior executive. How much do I, how much do I say, whoa, whoa, whoa that's not, that's not the way we would do it. Yeah. And how much what do I I'm just listen? I am hearing that there is something that you need to be coached on. There is a fear there about levels. I'm here. I may be wrong, but there's something about this person is a VP or this is an executive or this is this. And I, the way I, I create one-on-one -on -one relationships to create a um, designed alliance with them of how I'm going to show up, but they're giving you so much go for training. Yeah. So yeah. it's good to be curious and to listen and ask questions like what what value do you see? In and nothing's mm -hmm. wrong. Just mm -hmm. Got that down so you can understand where they are and where's their mindset so you can meet them where they are. You don't go yeah. into the crazy house of the, you know, like, oh, like I got to find out the individuals. You see where they are so you can see yeah. where you can help elevate them. And what is with the realistic next step? Because a lot of times they see them, they see the people below them as resources and things. So I need to monitor them. I need to watch them. I need to do these things. But what work do they need to do? Because they're they're part of that vertical slice. And mm -hmm. of course, like Kevin said, I do the 360. It's so important to help them see themselves as a leader, but also be curious about where is it you where it's like, ooh, this person is a VP instead of this person is Sam. And Sam sounds kind of a little bit like he doesn't really understand agility, and, um, but also forming that relationship. How do you, that's where we had that slide about entering into an organization, systems entry. Even as a coach, I have to set, I tell them, you're going to love me sometimes and you're not going to like me. And then you're going to want to tell me that you can't, you promise, right? Because you're not going to like me because they're not used to the yes, no, and maybe. Is that? Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, yep. that's, yep. so that's helpful. Just leaders to make the pace move by the next order. Yep. Um, um, yeah, so, we'll come Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and just just to reiterate what Luria okay. said, every every time, um, Josh, I've I've gotten into that kind of situation myself. Um, I have found it to be a I, a breakdown in alliance building that I did. It's something I didn't do as far as asking per permission. Um, how how do you want it? How do you want us to be when I disagree with you? How do you want us to be when the information that you're hiring me to bring in is is in, uh, intention or opposition to what you want to believe is true? And let's see if we can't hash that out a little bit so that we don't get into one of these kind of dangerous conversations of yeah. um, it's too late, sure. right? It's beyond the last responsible moment to use that lean phrase. So, yeah. so this is my one. I think it's hilarious, but this is what they want us to do. Like, come in yep. and, and all this other kind of stuff. It's like well, you, your mindset is like. Where is it from? Like, are we still in that century? Like, what are you talking about? But they're like, no, we want this, but they're really here. So let me be like where they are. 
and like I have a whole thing where I do a systems entry with each each person or each group I'm working with because yep. each person each group is totally different. But yeah, so um, we will get to your question in a minute. Um, Karen, we'll come back to questions. I yes, probably. yay for theories, constraints, questions. Yeah. <laughs> so I love this slide because I like funny <laughs> stuff. Um, how do they work? We also want to talk about how they work together. And this is also in the middle, which is not here, is the program, right? We always forget about the people in the middle. And I've been on every level of the organization. And I'm going to tell you that in the middle was hard because I was pulled in so many different directions. Um, but it is a space where the, the middle is actually like, we have, we'll talk about it in the middle when we talk about decision making. But the middle portion is very important because it's like the bridge it's the bridge between there is no like you'll know like dr was saying <laughs> there is no direct link from team to enterprise there there's always something in the middle like the program level that is so project managers program managers are so important um because they do a lot they bridge that they, they're a bridge between them but enterprise coaches of course work with agile team coaches they coach they, a lot of times they will coach agile team coaches um you know but program is so and they work together in a system, hopefully, because when they're not working together, you see a lot of chaos. You'll see um, it going different routes, you know. So I don't know if you have something to say on this. Okay. Nope. I'm, I'm going to switch slides. Um, <laughs> Agile team coaching benefits. Employment engagement on the team level. We talked about, you know, delivering excellence, enable better outcomes, focus, productivity, Continuous improvement, please. <laughs> but a lot of times I think it's funny. Like we want continuous improvement. No, you don't, because you don't want to do anything to make it happen. It's hilarious to me what they say they want. I think they Googled it and they just came up with some cute words. Um, but agile team coaches do do this. They foster communications. And I don't like the word the right outcomes, but sometimes it's like what outcomes are, you know, but the ones that will help in the particular case, not like it's the right one. I wrote it down. Let's not be flexible. Agile means flexibility. I think that's what it means. Um, I'm gonna let Kevin, even yeah, though I am an enterprise coach, we switch. Like he will talk to this one. Cool. Yeah, I want you just sort of proceed through, and we'll let, I haven't memorized the decks. So. Um, yeah. so yeah, enabling organizational strategy vision. So that I think is a helpful uh, thing from a complexity perspective, right? Like we don't necessarily know what future is going to come true. Actually, we can't know because it's not knowable. So what do we do instead? How do we do things like scenario planning or options-based planning, adaptive planning, that kind of stuff? Um, how do we create strategic statements that have uh, enough information in them to know kind of what's our true north, but without being so specific that the implementation is spelled out. And as we learn things that invalidate that implementation, uh, we're in trouble. Okay. Um, identifying bottlenecks and chaos. So uh, constraints are important. Theory of constraints is a thing. Um, how do we bring that thinking into uh, enterprise-wide processes? Like how do we introduce value stream maps for an example, which you know cut across that whole delivery process so that we can see um, where things are constrained uh, and begin to organize differently around them. Um, yeah, Karen, so how do we help people to understand that? Got to teach them <laughs> and we got to give them experiences of, of um, you know, just, man, how is this, how is this playing out in, in your shop? Right. And I like to use the example of laundry because it's pretty common. I think everybody has some degree of experience with it. Um, so I often use that as an illustration of uh, theory of constraints and operating your system at the rate of the bottleneck rather than um, overproducing uh, upstream from it and just creating a lot of problems. And it's also like, I want to say, it's also um, what do they find important about it? Like a lot of times people are to to change, um, you know, to even convince them is to show like, I sometimes just let it look out, look where, you know, understand they'll say, oh, they're underperforming or somewhat lacking, really? But what is your input into this? Um, mm -hmm. What is that? That's, you know, that's one of the value stream and things yep. like that. 
I can show like, here's what is actually the real of going on. And so it's one big thing you're trying to influence is speaking the language that they understand. Um, what is the language that they use? And then, because we can use all the techniques we want, but yeah. you speak French to an ex executives, program levels, and teams speak totally different languages. And it's being able to understand what is important to the person that is in front of you. It's so important. And that is a lot of emotional intelligence and cultural intelligence as well, being able to understand the person in front of you. It is, it, yeah. it works. But go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, and and um, another uh, so so building on that sort of one of the reasons I like value streams so much is that they make sense to that complicated industrial mindset. And yet, as we look at them, they also create a bridge to like theory of constraints thinking. And so, one of the frequent um, I don't know for those of you that are coaching, uh, how many times have you introduced something like some sort of a visualization? work visualization thing and people say this is too hard to manage and and it's not that the board is too hard to manage they have too much work in process and so that's hard to manage and if you can't even manage the visualization what does that suggest about how much work you actually have in flight yeah. and maybe that's the problem maybe it's worth learning about managing the visualization because that's going to give you the visibility into what's actually happening in your organization and once people start to see things i like i use a lot of language around optics and visibility and transparency there's a lot of metaphor in there because so much of what we're trying to do is making visible what is otherwise invisible and making transparent what is not able to be seen and so how do we how do we bring visibility to some of the stuff there's lots of ways to do it but uh, I, I do think that there's something in there. It's, it's one of my go-to uh, approaches. Exactly. Um, it also helps us then bring a, a systems view. It enables us to have multiple perspectives into things. Um, it enables us to, uh, in, in Susan Scott's book, Fierce Conversations, she talks about bringing together lots of different parts of the organization, have a, what she calls a beach ball conversation, where the HR perspective is one, stripe on a beach ball and and budgeting or, or you know finance is the yellow stripe and it is a blue stripe and you talk about a problem from these different angles and and get a, a more complete picture of it um, rather than one of them having to be right yeah uh, we want to be coaching and training and mentoring unlike at a, 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 a team level coach um, with, who will probably be doing this stuff uh, an enterprise coach, we're trying to build programs that do this stuff. And we're interfacing with learning and development and we're interfacing with HR and we're interfacing with management to ensure that the capability building that we've agreed needs to happen is able to be achieved, um, not just at a team, but across an entire system. Yeah. Um, change management, it's a, uh, it's its own whole big thing. <laughs> we don't want to go. We're just letting you know. Yeah. Uh, yep. And same thing with organizational flow, clarity, and scaling. All yeah. of these are uh, big, big, big topics. Yeah. So. So here's another cartoon because I love <laughs> comics. Uh, uh, this is how you feel sometimes. This is at least how I feel. <laughs> yep. Yeah. A lot of times we do a lot of complexity. Let's throw more people at it. What? See, so it's a silly meeting we just had. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to talk about three considerations. So how do you show up? How do you want to engage in decision making? And then your focus. So how do you show up? Googly eyes. Do you show up like this? <laughs> Do you not realize you show up like this? Like your, your impact is very strong. And I'm, I know you guys have met leaders where you're like, or people, and I'm going to say leaders, I mean anybody. Everyone is a leader. We all lead in whichever way we want. But the impact feels aggressive. It feels like you can't talk. So sometimes we don't realize we show up like that. Do we show up like this? Oh, no. I don't understand. The sky is falling. Ah. You know, those people like every minute, it's like panics, like relax. Are you like the funny person all the time and you're never serious? Nothing's wrong with that because I'm a funny person. So I like that one. I'm biased. Are you the like <laughs> super all over the place? Like, 
Like, I know how to be like that, you know. Are you the, hmm. But also, are you like, I know everything. There's curiosity in this, but it's also, hmm, let me prove how wrong you are. Like, who is that person? I don't like him or her or they or, or whatever. And are you the person who needs to be quiet or are you the person who needs to speak? So do I need to unzip or do I need to zip? I'm going to be as honest. Sometimes I need to zip. I didn't say that out loud, but I did. <laughs> so three levels of leadership with your Kevin is going to speak to this rather yeah. quickly. Rather quickly. So this comes right out of Bill Joyner's work uh, in leadership agility. Um, expert level leaders are extremely good at tactical problem solving. They're very good at having uh, answers. They believe leadership comes from how they're able to um, answer those questions, solve problems, and um, authority comes from knowledge. And it's about so self. So it's yep. like active listening, it's level one. Me, 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 level one. Yep. And it's not that any of these are better than others. They're just fit for different kinds of problems and different kinds of contexts. Yep. Achievers uh, begin to uh, unlock more strategic levels of thinking. They're able to articulate goals. They're able to articulate outcomes. Um, they believe in uh, kind of collective efforts, uh, but they still put themselves in the middle. If, if they're not there, they've it, it's not going to happen. So it's still a... Uh, what we'd call a conventional or heroic based uh, approach to leadership. They're very interested in the second level of listening, which is data. They're good at information. They understand, but they also are beyond just themselves. But they know a lot about the information, organizational strategy. And and no, real quick, I want to add that, um, like Kevin says, they're all useful. At, like experts are very good at tactical things. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people, you can be a great leader as an achiever as well. Yeah. And each of these levels, um, as you access them, you bring along the pr prior ones. It's not like you leave them behind. Um, you just get choice of what you do. Uh, so catalyst level leaders are where true collaboration and collective wisdom are become accessible. Um, we start operating more from a uh, sense of purpose and values and uh, a, a real deep belief in collective wisdom. And so uh, agile processes and ways of working really unlock powerfully uh, under catalyst level leadership. And so when we're trying to help organizations um, become more agile in their abilities to address uh, complex adaptive problems, we want to see if we can um, foster some catalyst level leadership. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. It can take quite a while, uh, though th there's there's a pretty pretty big disconnect of again the the ability to solve compact complex problems at expert and achiever levels uh, it doesn't go so well. Yeah, and this is like catalyst leaders are ten percent of leaders, so not a lot. Mm -hmm. of when you get to work with them, it's amazing though. Yeah, it's really no really a lot of fun. It's really cool. Catalyst leader, I took it. Come work with me. No, okay. well, no, but they're more, they look, they're like the, um, the third level listen, and they look at the whole system. They're looking forward beyond just the problem. They look beyond that. They're looking, you'll hear more we language. So I'm curious with you guys, put in the chat, are you more comfortable agreeing or disagreeing? Meaning you, you like to agree a lot or are you, okay, are you okay with saying no? I am okay with disagreeing, but some people are more comfortable. So I'm curious which one you're more comfortable with. This is right. checking to see if anyone's still paying attention. I know. I don't know. Maybe they're not. <laughs> they all went. They all went to the pub. <laughs> they all went to the sleep. I know. That's okay because we're recording for all the people who do love us. Um, courage. Yes, Stephanie, you're right after my heart. Um, not not confrontational. Those are they're very useful too. But when you're on the end. In any level of the organization, it's good to be to have courage. But on the enterprise, you better have some courage because it's mm -hmm. you're up there with a very outgoing people. And if you don't, you're gonna get eaten up. Yep. You know. But it's okay to be more comfortable knowing what skill that you have. Um, are you better, more comfortable talking or listening? And nothing, one of them is wrong. <laughs> it's just knowing which one you're more comfortable. No, this is about who you are listening. 
Thanks. You better get comfortable with listening. Yeah, I love the aha moments of green, but you, you, yes. So listening is also very important. Like I'm a, I'm a talker, but I had to, like, I spent lots of time really prepping myself and, you know, I get prepared to listen. Now I'm a, I'm a great listener if I want to be. That's my default. For that. Do you react or observe? And let's be honest. Do you, is your first instinct to react? Or do you observe? Hmm. And neither is wrong. It's just knowing what you do. Are you reactive? And reactive looks like more like, like I'll give an example. I walked into the kitchen. My daughter, the dishes aren't done. And I can react and be like, why didn't you do the dishes? And she's like, well, mom, I was doing my homework. And I'm so horrible, right? I'm like, oh man, why did I react? Observe is I observe, I sense, and then I make, and I sense make. Yes, Karen, I love it. You actually react hard to catch myself. Me too. I am reactive, but I've learned to observe because when you observe, you get that's when curiosity steps in. So be curious is when you're observing. So walk in, I've seen it said like, why is everybody laughing? Why aren't you working? We are working, but I can't laugh. Like, what's going on? So it's just knowing how you show up is important. I don't know what happened because I clicked. We're going to go um, skip through this one just because of time, but we're going to go through it really quickly. But I cross out servant leadership. A lot of people get it's because of it's just a cultural thing. And same thing, keep it, don't do it, do it. It's up to you. I just use the word in power. So listening, three levels of listening, what can you talk about? Level one, self, two is information. Three is like the whole, whole picture of the whole person. Develop empathy, know how to walk in someone else's shoes, <laughs> being able to have perspective, being vulnerable. I did not like that word at all. Checked in Zoom. I don't know what you're saying, Kevin. All right. <laughs> can you, my microphone's not working. Can you hear me? Check one, it's, check two. It, I can hear you. It kind of keeps fading in and out. I don't know if it's just me, but. Okay. It's just you. Um, no, I'm joking. I don't know. So I once um, vulnerable. It was my theme for the year. Vulnerability was like a yuck for me. I'm gonna be honest. I was like, what? You want me to do what? It opened up so many doors when I can ask for help and be vulnerable. It's such a skill that all leaders have. And BJ actually, he demonstrates this lovely every time I've been with him. So if you're looking for people who do this, always look for others who something that you're working on, they do very well. And so of course, self-awareness. How do you really listen? I'm so serious about listening. It's so important. Please listen. <laughs> and you'll know how well you're listening by the impact that it has on others. Hmm. I just talked closer to the mic, Kevin. There you go. He's like, what did you do? <laughs> Direct wrestling me. Um, and these are some other ones. Um, Kevin, did any of these stand out for you? I just want you guys to be able. Oh, I have one. I'm going to talk again because I like to talk. Courageous conversations. It is so important to be able, Joshua, to have those courageous conversations with these leaders who are all over the place. But it doesn't mean, it means using your superpowers to be able to meet them where they are. But being able, you can't grow people if you're afraid. You mm -hmm. have to sometimes speak it into the air. I had Michael, one of the Michaels, because I always forget names. I'm not good with the names. But he said to me, do you really need to say that? Like it was one of the most, he was like, are you, I was like, oh, it just changed my world because he was real with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, I'm doing some work right now with some scrum masters and uh, managers around the true North for themselves of what are your personal values? And they don't know. And what they do know is that they're reacting. They find themselves reacting. And uh, from a coaching perspective, that resistance or reacting can often be because one of our core values is sort of being stepped on or violated. And if we don't know what those values are, then we can't know how they're being violated. So there's some um, self-awareness and knowledge um, that's enabling them to, to stay more proactive and more grounded in, uh, yeah. in their ability to choose a response rather than simply reacting. Exactly. It's really, really helpful stuff. Yes, I'm all into values because it help, allows you to focus <laughs> all, as well. And you also know, um, who do you need to be? Like, if I don't know my values, I don't know, I'm confusing my role. I don't know, I don't know who I need to be um, as well. 
Yes. And oh, can we know like what are your passions, areas of growth, and superpowers, please? Can you know? Can you please know? It's so important to know no matter if you're trying to choose between the two, what are you passionate about? Where are your areas of growth? And what are your superpowers? You know, what are your limitations? What are those things so that mm -hmm. you can grow? You know, a lot of people are like, I don't know what I'm good at. Well, you need to know those things so you can partner with someone who can compliment you. You know, I don't mm -hmm. need to know how to, I have Kevin, if I need a now I'm like, Kevin, explain to them this complexity theory for me. I mean, I understand it. I just, he loves to talk about it. So I partner with him yeah. a lot, you know? And then I talked about culture competency. This is very important because emotional intelligence is being able to be aware, but it's how do we adapt? to other cultures. And when I mean cultures, I'm not just talking about race and gender. I'm also talking about marketing from engineering. They're totally different cultures. So how do you talk to different teams and different organizations? Because they all have a culture and it hums. So sometimes agilists go into cultures and organizations and they're trying to to actually put in agility. Like they're trying to, like, I'm gonna plug it in there and it's not, yeah, it does not work. So it's being able to culturally adapt and it's, and it's that's so important um, to be able to be, to interact across different cultures. Um, yeah, it's one of my, I'm gonna let Kevin speak to this one. How do you like to engage in decision-making? Oh, here's my card. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love cartoons. <laughs> so doesn't it, doesn't it feel like organizations do this? I decided to stop making decisions. No. Decision. I wish some people actually would. I'm gonna be honest with you. Like I wish no. you would just relate to this. Or 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 even better. Um, yeah, we're gonna let the teams decide that, and the teams decide it. We don't like what they decided, so we're gonna revoke that, and we're gonna do something else. <laughs> Right. It's like, well, then, then it wasn't actually that decision authority wasn't actually given to them. Um, oh. So yeah, how do we how do we make decisions here, right? That's that's probably a really important uh, conversation to have. Uh, Dan Mezik has a bunch of stuff. If you follow him on LinkedIn, he's constantly hammering about decision making authority and decision making rights and making that explicit. Um, it's really really critical um, to know who and how makes those decisions. And you know that usually, as things get from big, big, big picture on down to more operational, they tend to get more concrete. They tend to get more predictable. Um, what about all of that? Um, it's probably helpful to um, introduce some tools and approaches. Uh, things like theory of constraints, for example, could be really, really helpful. Yeah, and. and Oh, go ahead, Kevin. I'm sorry. I was just going to ask you if you had anything to add on this one. Yeah, I was going to say, just look at this and see which one strategic, big pictures, enterprise, programs in the middle with tactical, operational. It's really for you to look at and see which one do you feel most comfortable in making decisions with. Because some people feel more comfortable at, you know, different levels. Here's one. Do you tend to follow or move? And where is this from, Kevin? The this, sounds, this sounds like Cantor, structural yeah. dynamics. See, partner. <laughs> I, I knew the answer, but I like asking yeah. this. Um, yeah, so are you, do you like to follow or do you like to move? It is, it's important to know which, yeah, you like to move, but also they're both important. So you need both, but it's like, which one is your strength? It's good to know what you like to do. It's good at influence and motivating. Are you an influencer or you like to motivate? Could be both. Mm -hmm. But I know for sure at the enterprise level, influence is very important. And a lot of times at the team, we're motivating a lot. We still, we may motivate leaders, but a lot of influencing. That's kind of meeting them where they are. Are you skilled at more high complexity or lower complexity? This will help you decide which level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Do you have anything to say, yep. Kevin? Just that that was the, the second of three considerations. <laughs> yeah. So these that's... are the three considerations as you're kind of f f deciding for yourself which, which of these um, makes the most sense for you or which is more interesting to you. Um, yeah. Again, neither is right, neither is correct, neither is, it, it's just what makes sense to you, what is, what is interesting and um, 
depending on the context, some of these things are going to be more emphasized or less emphasized. And as we close out, I'm just going to go through these kind of quickly because we only have five minutes and I want to drop something into the chat for you guys. Um, once again, of course, there's another one. If I could focus, I would know that. So whatever. Yeah what to focus on why are you asking me all this stuff here's some quick things where do you like to focus is for you just to think about team or organization do you prefer to create strategy or implement strategy create strategies more strategic of course at the team level we is enterprise but of course at the team level we do create strategy but you do it a lot mm -hmm. at the team at the enterprise and a lot of implementation of strategy you do both but this the create one comes up in enterprise do you like to focus on the task or the person? The person, teams, right, Kevin? We work a lot I with think people, so. relationships. There's a lot of relationship. Anybody on the enterprise level, yes, you work with them, but not as much. You're doing a lot of the big picture strategy thinking, but in the team, if you really love that one-on-one -on -one and getting to know your team, and that's what you love, it's definitely a team. Oh, here's one. It's a trick. Do you lead as a star? Do you lead from the back? If you lead as a star, you need a new profession um, because there are we aren't stars. <laughs> Leading from the back means that we can take a step back, but we also can lead from the front, the side with a partner. But this was a quick a trick. Some people tell me, I want to lead as a star. Oh, wrong, mm -hmm. wrong. You know, let me help you with this 360. Let me, you need some coaching. Uh, <laughs> no stars. Um, now we just want you, I'm going to drop in the chat. This is about building your roadmap. Here are some, of course, courses that you can take. But of course, always your fundamentals, your facilitation coach. Please get some intermediate stuff along your way if you're stuff beginning. <laughs> Professional coaching and mentoring, please. That's a yes. Oh, my goodness, no matter where you are. Um, I'm going to skip this one, but <laughs> because of time. Because of time. <laughs> It's just of what we went over and I'm going to drop in um, what's your agile journey and I'm going to drop in the chat this um, from AWA about um, some it's a PDF of um, uh, your learning path. Yeah, um, I'll just speak really briefly to this. I mean, again, this is a, a little bit of, of a little salesy pitch, uh, but we do provide uh, a lot of different trainings across a lot of different um, domains and disciplines. And uh, we hope that there's one that you might be interested in. And we will be offering the, uh, the Enterprise Agile Coach Boot Camp, the ENT and the CAT, in November now in uh, Luria's famous or fabulous San Diego. So uh, if an early winter is starting to get you cold, I know it will be for me. A trip to San Diego might be on the ticket. Come learn with Luria and I will be uh, co-delivering that. Here is the time. Here's the, and I put it in there. It's in that PDF. And we also teach the enterprise cohort, which starts July 5th. Um, here are some of your lovely trainers. Um, mm -hmm. And we do the, I do both. I do the AC as well. So. Perfect. 